you started writing poetry as a freshman at USC in 1967. Correct. And you say that as a child and as an adolescent, you were not allowed to speak. And I was very taken uh, by that uh, statement. Could you expand this a little more? Well, I lived in a f with a family that was very uh, volatile. And so I kept to myself mm -hmm. because if I was too uh, demonstrative, I would often be punished. So I tried to blend into the, the, the walls as much as possible. Uh -huh. I, if I ever said anything, I often was like hit or something that wow. it was, if it was against what my parents believed, my mother primarily, um, and my mother was a very um, um, erratic in mm -hmm. her emotions and had been very, very um, violent with my older sister. I can remember her smashing her in the face with a skillet full of pork chops. And so I always had this fear if mm -hmm. I did anything wrong, it would happen to me. And I had never written poetry until I started at USC. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, I probably would have stopped, except I won the Academy of American Poets Award mm -hmm. when I was a freshman. And uh, that's all she wrote. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. You said that um, I started writing poetry to figure out who I might be. I didn't know what I thought inside my brain, and I wrote to discover who I was. Mm -hmm. If you could have a, co a conversation with this uh, young woman at, uh, in 19, uh, 1967, do you think you both have been writing from the same reason or from the same core? Sometimes it actually amazes me that I've, I am what I am now. Because the thought of having a career as a poet, it seems so ludicrous at this, in 2014, you know. But when I was a young woman, I oh, sure, I could be a poet, why not, you know. And, and, uh, and also when I, I got my bachelor's in English in uh, 1971, it was possible to have a career as a poet, or at least I thought it was. You didn't need to go to graduate school, and you just grad became a poet mm -hmm. and started giving book readings and books and stuff, and it was a lot different. And uh, I also had um, grandiose ideas about my worth, my self-worth. But you got this, this award so mm -hmm. early, so. I know, and, and that was actually the worst and the best thing that happened to me at that time. It was good because it gave me an idea of something I could do. Mm -hmm. And it was bad because it gave me an idea of something I thought I could do. I actually went through a period for, of about seven or eight years that I couldn't get anything published after being very successful, successful. very young. What about this aspect of writing to know who you are? Well, I think a lot of people, especially young poets, do, do that even if they don't acknowledge it. Um, because I had to give voice to the thoughts that I was having because I didn't even know what, I was an unformed young woman. I was like a piece of clay. And the more I wrote, the more I discovered my own thought process. You are a very accomplished poet. You have 10 books of poetry and short fiction, uh, including, I'm gonna mention some of the names, uh, mm -hmm. Washing the Language, uh, Frisian, The Last Girl in the Land of Butterflies, mm -hmm. uh, The Burning, uh, Do Iguanas Dance, I love this title, Do Iguanas Dance Under the Moonlight. Do you know what that's based on? No. It's a song. Do Iguanas uh. Dance <laughs> Under the Moonlight. Do you want to dance under the moonlight? It was a song in the 60s. <laughs> uh, as you, you also were from 96 to 2002, the literary curator, curator of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. uh, you coordinated the Writers in Focus program. Uh, you have been an instructor of poetry at UCLA for, uh, since 1990, I mm -hmm. believe. Mm -hmm. um, you were part of uh, several theater groups. One of them was uh, the Company Theater in Los Angeles. You founded, um, in 1987, the L.A. Poetry Theater. Mm -hmm. You are also part of the, I think it's called Women. Uh, Nearly Fatal Women. Nearly Fatal Women with Susan uh, Loomis and uh, Linda Albertano. So looking back at, you, at your body of work as a poet, um, when did you start taking your craft more seriously? Or if something happened in your career that made you think, well, I am a poet? 
From the beginning. From the beginning. Yeah, I, I did. Even when the talent wasn't there, I thought I was a poet. Right. That was that was what I really thought of myself. That was the one thing I thought I could do that would make a difference in the only possibility that I had to make a life for myself um, because I could not do anything else really. Um, I, I suffered for, with a great deal of um, mental illness and um, the poetry helped me quite a bit. And it gave me uh, not just an outlet, but a voice and also helped other people as well. I, I currently um, teach a workshop at the um, Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health. And I work with the clients there. And uh, it's been a, a great source of uh, fulfillment for me to help the people there. Do you do like, like a writing workshop with them? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is this poetry or also fiction? It's whatever they want whatever to write. They want to write. <laughs> it's like... you, you talk about focusing your mind. Mm -hmm. What's the connection between this focusing your mind and poetry writing? I was um, diagnosed with schizoaffective schizophrenia when I was 21. And I was, um, at one point, a patient at Camarillo State Hospital. Mm -hmm. And I've always done well in institutions of any sort universities, hospitals, wherever I went, everybody liked me. That's supposed to be a little joke. Anyway, um, I, was, I was a very good patient. I mean, I was always, you know. One day I was sitting in the, um, in the day room and I remember thinking to myself that, um, well, I could stay here and be okay. You know, they'd take care of me, blah, blah, blah. Or I could think of the one thing it is I might want to do other than be a dead poet living in a mental institution. Mm. And I thought, hmm, might like to be a famous Los Angeles poet. And I decided to put as much energy into being an alive LA poet as I did being a crazy poet. And whichever side won, so be it. Hmm. And that was like the turning point in my life. I when was this, more or less? Which year was this? 1975 or wow. so. So I decided, I made a conscious decision at that time to put as much energy in being in the positive light as in the negative one. And I started to, I heard voices and things. I, I had the devil come to me and told me if I, if I killed myself before I reached the age that Sylvia Plath was, mm -hmm. he would make me more famous than she was. So I was going around trying to kill myself like every week. And uh, that makes it sound more silly than it was. It was actually pretty horrible. And I decided that I would, if I could focus on the poem that I was working on, the, the voices that I heard would not harm me as, well, as much. To focus on the line, I had to push away the voices that were harming me in my head. And until eventually I could stay in that world longer than in my schizophrenic mind. It was difficult at first because, you know, I kind of was used to that world, yeah. and, and, but soon I was able to stay there longer and longer. And you became your home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to mention one thing about USC at that point. If they hadn't come to rescue me, I would have still been there. USC, I, when I was an undergraduate, I was an honor student and I am... Um, was in a group called Mortarboard, and I was selected outstanding, outstanding seniors and everything. And I'd been in Camarillo for a while, and I don't know how long it had been because I'd had shock treatments before I got there. And the doctor there had told me um, that he was either going to recommit me, or I mean, I was going to either recommit myself, or he was going to recommit me, and it was not going to be a good thing. And somewhere in the back of my head, I thought, hmm. Even in prison, you're allowed one phone call. So I said, 
can I have a phone call? And they said, okay. So I called USC and I called the Dean of Women, who I'd been one of, they called Joan's girls. <laughs> dean Joan was the Dean of Women. <laughs> and uh, I'd been one of her, you know, star students. And I was in the honor program she was in. And I said, Dean Joan, they don't believe a damn thing I say. They don't believe I got to go to Cambridge. They don't believe I won all these awards. And the, the next thing I know, they apparently called Camarillo, and I was let go the next day. Because of USC? Mm-hmm. Wow. In one interview, you said, uh, it was in 1996, you said that you uh, were able to distinguish two types of poetry in Los Angeles, the performance poetry and the literary poetry. Do you still see that today? Do you, have you changed your mind about this? It's not so much the literary poets and the performance poet now. I think it's more like the academic mm -hmm. poets and um, spoken word poets. A little bit different. Um, I think the proliferation of MFA programs has exploded um, the poetry, not necessarily for the best world, um, because every year, every, it's like, when I had first graduated from my, my BA, my undergraduate, there were maybe six MFA programs in the entire country, and now there's 200 and something, and every MFA program that every year graduates a certain amount of uh, graduate students, and each one of those has to write a book of poetry to graduate, and for like the last 30 years, and that they get more and more and more and more. And, um, and what's unfortunate about it is they all kind of sound the same. They have the same stamp on it. And I don't think that's really doing a service to American poetry. They all, I mean, you can kind of sniff one out, an MFA poem or an MFA collection at 50 paces. They don't really usually have much of an original voice when they do, it's really fantastic. And uh, could you um, could you place yourself in which kind which, of? Well, gee, I don't know. I'm kind or of. Or you travel from one to the other. Yeah, more like that. I think people tend to think of me more as a uh, performance poet, but I would prefer that they didn't. <laughs> but I, <laughs> well, I, you yeah. you had a character once, uh, mm -hmm. Russian. What's the name? Russian, Russian Sonia. Sonia. You had a character. Uh, well, she Who's, was. Who is Russian Sonia? Uh, well, nobody knew about her except myself. <laughs> I mean, it was just my the name I gave for the person that gave my poetry readings when I was young, 20, 21, 22, when I was first starting to give poetry readings. I was terrified. I mean, and so what I would do would be put on this character that I called to myself, Russian Sonia. It was like a poetry coat. And... Um, and she would be the person that was the flamboyant character that gave the poetry readings. And me, I'd be sitting in my car, hysterically <laughs> freaked out that I'm up there. I used to wear a lot of uh, costumes when I was giving poetry readings when I was young. Until, well, I used to always wear like 1940s dresses and seamed stockings and hats and gloves. And I mean, I really dressed like Joan Crawford or somebody like that, mm -hmm. because I found that, I don't know, I just loved it. And um, and I, I, I would have probably kept doing it, except I felt at one point that people were coming to see just what hat I was wearing instead of coming to hear my poetry. And and then I decided that they were it was not serving me, that people were not taking me seriously. So I kind of stopped doing that, although I do have a love for costumes still. <laughs> Um, I would like uh, you to read one of your poems from this anthology from Grand Passion. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Red, Blue, Smoke, and Steel. Oh, you know? sure. All nerve this city, ferocious. It chews and spits out, exhales blue, smoke, and steel. And I am like this city edging towards oblivion. The mirror cuts whatever facts I have known about myself. Woman, artist, a quick fix. This identity, a hook to pin my night clothes on. 
what do I know about reality? Celluloid captures my tinsel and frailties as I jag through barrios and suburbs, mini malls pock the landscape. Los Angeles, mi corazón, what has become of you? I remember fruit trees blossoming like my dreams of success, now uprooted by a concrete depression. We work, we wait, nothing comes, not synapse, sex, or sacrament, just the toil of the mundane overblown by expectation as it budges like a cancer with no chance of remission. We go to bed at night. We get up in the morning. That is our truth again and again. When you write, do you have uh, like a certain um, process that you always use? I usually start with, hand, uh, with a pen. Mm -hmm. I, I really need that because it's like the poem comes down the brain and out the and right, right on the page. Mm -hmm. With a pen, usually, if I can find it, my fountain pen. <laughs> and then I do like two or three v versions that way, and then I put it on the computer. And I keep each version and number them because I do teach a lot of poetry classes, and I find the students find it very useful to see how my poems progress from the first version to sometimes usually the ninth or tenth version before the poem's finished. Mm. Um, I think you have a dialogue between the um, quotidian, is that a quotidian, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. mundane, the everyday, everyday life. Mm -hmm. You have a relationship or a, like a movement or a dance between that world and the metaphysical or the philosophical. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that dance in your work between the uh, quotidian and the philosophical? Funny you should ask. For a long time when I was getting started, I wrote about three things only. Madness, suicide, four things. I hate my mother mm -hmm. and bad boyfriends. That's all I wrote about, the entire, that's my entire. And I realized at one point that I had to open up my um, repertoire because people were gonna be bored with me. Or if not bored, they were not gonna come hear me read because that, that, was, the, that was the entire scope of what I wrote about. So I decided I was gonna have to write about something else, something more than just those things. So that was part of my conscious, conscious idea to attack the poetry that was inside of me, to, to, to go at it at a different angle. And, um, and I did that, like for example, I wrote this poem called I Eat Lunch with the Schizophrenic that was, I was actually a schizophrenic when I wrote it, and it was about a lunch I had with another patient who was a poet at Barney's Beanery in Hollywood. And it goes, begins with something like, I check for Gestapo agents under the table. There are no electronic bugs in the flowers. We talk freely about jamming devices and daredevil escapes, blah, blah, blah. But it actually ends with, um, the problem's not with the hamburgers, chili, or Cokes, I explain. The problem is being susceptible. So I used humor to make a very, you know, as, a, as a Mary Poppins says, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down a bit. I would like you to read one poem uh, from uh, this book, mm -hmm. Washington Language. It's called um, Mystery Spot. Mystery spot with gaze turned inward. What vortex pulsates above my bed? Sprawled among the flannel sheets and four felines waiting to be fed, he ponders these questions of ultimate torque and consequence. How the little wheels of his mechanism spin Great is his dynamo, a nuclear reactor whirs in his Kenmore guarantee. I stick to him like gravity, 
an inescapable pull impels my Volkswagen down the two to the 134, hurtling past freeway exits, taco stands, and mini-marts from Highland Park to Lake Street, past the tinted windows of Roscoe's House of Chicken and Waffles, the Planned Parenthood Clinic whose client's cup furtive joints in the parking lot, the Craftsman House with the blue Christmas lights where Lil' Kim blares from the porch, down the street maple leaves pile like dunes in his marvelous yard. There, in the melting light, I stop to measure the turbulence, plant herbs, calibrate our inverse polarity, wind socks flapping in the sun, an oscillation of simple mysteries caught, then funneled outward. You mentioned uh, uh, writers that you studied uh, when you were in, in college, or uh, poets that are an influence in your work, and you mentioned uh, E. Cummings, T.S. Eliot, uh, Sylvia Plath. You also talk about Johnny Mitchell. Mm -hmm. um, do you, which other uh, influences or references do you have in your, in your work that you would like to mention? Ah, well, Anne Sexton, of course. Um, Yusef Komanyaka, I like very much. Um, Charles Simic, uh, Frank O'Hara, Lawrence Robb big influence, especially his book, The Collector of Cold Weather, made a big difference on me, my work. He could take something very, very prosaic and use it to make a much bigger, bigger um, mm -hmm. point, the attack of the crab monsters. The speaker of the poem is a scientist who's been turned into this crab monster, and he's coming after his fiance, and she's behind the scuba tanks. And he's speaking in the voice of the crab the, monster. Yeah, the monster. But the whole poem revolves around the change that comes over him, and that's the, the main point of the poem. And that's I just love that poem. I, I, I teach it every year in my class. There's also a reference to Oscar Wilde with the, the We mm -hmm. Kill the, the Things We Love. Yes. So. So in that sense, the poem uh, is similar to the leap you do in your poetry, like you take the mundane and you make it more, you know, philosophical. Or, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. What do you try to communicate to this, uh, to your students, to, to fu future poets? Well, I kind of consider myself a poetry evangelist. I like to find people and con convert them to the church of poetry. <laughs> no, what I love about teaching is that I find I help some people find things in themselves that they don't know they have. That is the most fantastic thing. That is what keeps me going. I love it when people come to my classes and don't know what they're getting themselves into mm -hmm. and then transform themselves. I, I, I try not to put any uh, expectations. I, it makes me happy when people don't write like I do. It makes me very happy. I figure there's one of me. I don't need any more. So I really hope my students develop their own style and their own voice, and I encourage that. I would like to, uh, to end the conversation with the, uh, the poem from the Outlaw Bible of American Poetry. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, this poem has appeared in many, many anthologies, I, I think. The Door for Love and Death? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. I don't know if you, you know, wanna... and the thing that's weird about this poem, I never thought much about it, actually, <laughs> when I wrote it. Um, one thing that I, I, I often write poems as a response to things I've read. And there's a poet I really like I, named Tomas Salomon. And this was in response to a poem I read of his and in the poem was a line, the door for love and death. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe it was T.S. Eliot who said, minor poets borrow, major poets steal. But, so anyway, so this is the door for love and death, and it's based on uh, Tomas Salomon. You push the shadow against the wall, open the door for love and death. What rooms are rented there? In the room of exquisite torture, a woman watches her lover shave. In 
the room of hopeless romantic. A man weeps before a portrait of Voltaire. In the room of maternal instinct, the rose is embalmed. In the room of amorous adventure, both doors hide the tiger. In the room of my life, I give up one and love the other. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.